So. <clears throat> Alles klar. All right then. Well, thanks for the nice introduction. As you can see from the title of this presentation, Today's talk is about biometric and non-biometric ways of identifying people. In particular, it's about how cameras are a danger to these processes. This talk is based to a certain extent on a paper that I have done together with Ronnie Hench and Tobias Fiebig at T-Labs. And T Labs gave us this nice title slide here, which I have seen two, about two weeks ago while I was getting coffee, and I thought this is a very fitting poster, and I just I just had to use that here. I don't want to go too much into details here because I'm really trying to make a little nice little arc here. But essentially, this is about. Um, biometrics and, and key loggers. I also had to include this picture here. What I'm going to try is, I'm, I'm, we're going to do, taking steps away from the object of our desire from the biometric uh, attributes and let's start with uh, something simple with a fingerprint. This picture is pretty funny but it uh, has a serious background. Um, in the United States, the Supreme Court decided a couple of months ago that passwords um, are protected by the Fifth Amendment, but fingerprints are not. So you, the police can actually force you to unlock your iPhone using your fingerprint. And this is a little bit silly because, well, let's, let's take one step further away. Um, no, we have been focusing on the finger, but how often does it happen that you have Wolfgang Schäuble on your couch? No, it's, it's not about the Nazi sex party, but the, 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 the headline underneath that. You see that fingerprint here? I don't know who knows that story. It's It's been a couple of years by now. Um, when there was a huge fuss about the electronic identity card and the electronic passport, um, Dr. Schäuble was visiting the... Uh, or was, was uh, opening a faculty at the uh, university in Berlin and he was holding a speech there and back then he was the Secretary of State and uh, there were all these laws and I was kind of afraid because um, I thought this this man was crazy, the stuff that he was doing was, was really crazy. And obviously he uh, he had a glass of water in front of him and he drank from that glass and uh, for some reason we got a hold of that glass. And with a very primitive technique, uh, something that I will show you in detail later, we managed to get a one fingerprint and we, we published that fingerprint in our magazine Datenschleuder. And uh, this became pretty big. It was even in the in the built tabloid. And what Dr. Schäuble said is, I don't really care the hackers, I don't care if hackers have my fingerprint. But um, through the way I, I, I learned that he was rather displeased with that, even though he officially said that he didn't care. And what was even funnier is uh, I was with Constanza I was, a couple of weeks later. I was at an event where Mr. Zirke was and we met for coffee and we had a talk. It was a rather unpleasant talk, but all that time he really paid attention to his coffee cup and everyone just uh, left their cups wherever they were but he he took this cup with him and he never touched the glass that was at his speaker table. Now about the, the technique that we have used back then, there are a number of possibilities that uh, you can use in order to make a fingerprint visible. The two pictures in the top, you probably know that from from movies, you have some sort of powder uh, and uh, you can apply this powder over the fingerprint and the, the particles of that powder will stick to the residues, the fat residues that the fingerprint has left on the, on the surface. And the problem is if you are not very careful, 
With uh, that little brush that you have, uh, you can actually damage that fingerprint. So it's not really a good way. The police, they, um, in the meantime, they have moved on to the second method, which you can here see under that lid in the uh, lower left picture. There's a little bit of super glue, basically. Uh, one of the components of that glue is something that uh, evaporates at room temperature and it also sticks to the uh, to the residue and you will get a very nice white white imprint and uh, there's a little problem with that method too because if you keep that lid closed for too long the the vapors are not only sticking to the fingerprint but also to the area surrounding it so you have one big white spot and that's why we have a third option I don't know if it's something that is officially used. I rather stumble upon that. This, is, this picture was taken in a facility that makes very thin layers of gold and uh, I accidentally put a piece of glass in there that I had touched with my finger and I got a very nice picture of my fingerprint. So um, I can only recommend using that method. The problem is that these devices are not really cheap and it's not something that you can have at home in your kitchen. So this is for something that you can use on an even surface. There are other ways when, for example, you have a fingerprint on a piece of paper. You can either, what you can see here on the left, this is uh, some sort of acid that you can apply to the paper and it contains an indicator that reacts uh, with the, with stuff in the fingerprint and uh, leaves this nice pink residue and on the right side the picture that we have when you s see that little stripe uh, that's it's something that uh, I accidentally left a sheet of paper in the in the oven and my fingerprint was on it and apparently the fat dissolves at a certain temperature and it's a great way to make a fingerprint visible on a piece of paper. So if you ever want to write a ransom letter, I would recommend wearing a pair of gloves and of course dispose of this pair of gloves properly because your fingerprints will also be all over that pair of gloves. I wanted to tell a little bit more about the iPhone, but I reduced that a little bit. So I only have that one slide because the iPhone is pretty much a, a wonderful example how to get a nice fingerprint from an even surface. There's this nice glass pane with a black display underneath it. And you just have to touch it for briefly and all you have to do is put the phone on a normal scanner upside down and you can just scan the fingerprint in. So when, when the iPhone was released, I thought, hey, I'm going to have fun with this for a couple of weeks, but uh, turns out it broke after two days. And uh, I had broken it after two days because it was so easy to get a fingerprint off the iPhone. So if anyone wants to know more about this, uh, there's an episode of Chaos Radio. Uh, where we discussed this in length, all about the iPhone. So that was the past, and let's move on to the present stuff that we wrote about in our most recent paper. You, basically, you have to collect an item on which someone had left his fingerprint, and now let's uh, we can actually move away from, from whatever it is the person touched. We can go a foot away or we can go to the other end of the world because basically all we need is a camera of a mobile phone. And have you ever noticed that whenever you install an app on your phone that every other app is asking for permissions to use your cameras? You have a simple app such as a flashlight and the flashlight app will ask for permissions to use your camera. So it's something that most apps can do. And most phone cameras are, have a good enough quality to get really good pictures of a fingerprint. It's uh, a little staged, these pictures here. Uh, you you kind of have to have your finger right 
uh, above the camera and you have to have good lighting conditions and all that. But basically, what I'm saying is that with your regular 13 megapixel camera that you have in a mobile phone, uh, it's sufficient to get a good image of a fingerprint if lighting is okay. Uh, I use the desk lamp here. You can get really good results when you use the, the flash in your camera. However, this is something that will probably get noticed. So, um, when I did the, la the last uh, adjustments on my slides, um, I saw that you could actually use the notification lamp, uh, and this gives us sufficient lightning to to get a really good picture of a fingerprint. But of course, we don't only have one camera in a phone. Yeah, I also like that picture I had to include it. Normally, most phones nowadays have at least two cameras. And the camera that is in the front is getting better and better. The iPhone has 1.2 megapixels or something, but there are phones such as the HTC Desire, uh, people want to do selfies that have a good resolution. So um, this is something that we're going to see more and more. It also has 13 megapixels. And with a device like that, we did a couple of more experiments. And of course, the question is, where does that camera point? And this is a nice zombie picture of a coworker. The camera is, of course, uh, pointing at the face of the user. And here I have some nice animations. Uh, first time I ever used animations in my slides. Does anyone have an idea what I'm going for here? No, it's not about the it's not about the iris. It's about the pupil because there's a reflection in the pupil. the The screen of the phone is something that you can see as a reflection in the pupil and. Of course, you can also see a silhouette of the finger, and what is the finger touching? Is it's the pin pad. Also, we have this, like I said, with a 13 megapixel camera. So we tried that with a 13 megapixel camera. We have the breadth of the display, and we the display was about 30 pixels wide in the picture. So if you take that number pad with five keys, you will get about six pixels per per key, and this is more than sufficient to see which keys were pressed and get the pin that way. So we did some experiments and tried that manually and tried to figure out the pin, and we had a success rate of about 90% of the key presses we got right in the first attempt and the remaining 10% uh, in the second attempt. The nice thing is that uh, it's, it's okay if you don't get it right in the first try, because you have uh, a number of attempts to, to watch how the victim is entering the pin. And when you enter the pin, you also ha don't have to be correct in the first attempt. So you have, uh, even if you fail the first time, you will get it right in the second or third time. So using that technique, once you get access to the camera of the phone, you can actually find out the pin of the user. And this is not only something that works for a pin, but uh, also for passwords, although it's, uh, it's maybe a little bit more difficult, because here we have five keys, keyboards usually have ten keys next to each other, so we get uh, three pixels per key. At last year's CCS we had a talk, uh, someone had written a software to to do something like that, they also used data from the camera and, and analyzed the pictures. And also had a look at the reflection of the keyboard in the in the eye. And they had three pixels per key, and they had uh, a software that was able to make something out of that. And this is for a smartphone. I think of an iPad, for example, which is three times the size, so it really shouldn't be a problem there. Well, sometimes uh, the user is also wearing a pair of glasses. So this is our former Secretary of Defense. Uh, this is, of course, an extreme example. He has a very nice pair of glasses. And with today's cameras, uh, you, can, you can almost read what's on the display. And the nice thing is that the cameras are getting better and better. So you, um, without a doubt, uh, by this time next year, 
tatsächlich das, der Display inhaltlich You ist. will probably be able to read whatever is on the display. Ähm, das Bild hat man schon mal und jetzt oh, geht's. We already saw that picture and now let's have a look at the iris. Das Problem ist, well, the problem ähm, is that, mein Kollege hat vielleicht die dunkle Augen. Well, my, my coworker, he is, he has dark brown eyes. So for the first experiments that we did, we actually had to look out for someone else. So this is another coworker of mine, it's Kevin. He also uh, is, will be holding a talk here, I think tomorrow. And what we did is, again, we, we used the phone camera to, uh, to make these pictures and we printed these pictures. And we held it against that device and... Nee, die andere, bitte. Die da. Can, we, can we show that the, the other camera, please? Yeah. Da ist Wall Kevin einmal in Original. All right, so this is uh, Kevin. And here is the device. And Identification completed. Jetzt versuchen wir das mal mit diesem Teil und ich hoffe, das funktioniert. All right, let's, let's try if it works with the picture. Identification completed. Also, tatsächlich reicht es aus. Kannst du wieder zurückschalten, bitte? So, apparently it is really sufficient to have a picture with a not that great resolution and print that on a 2000 DPI printer, which is something that everyone has. And the 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 identification device is actually a high-end device. We paid more than a thousand euros for that. And it is used in, in certain systems for access control in banks and so on. But uh, like I said, until now, this has only worked for people with brightly colored eyes. But since I am working in in research and, and teaching, so we actually have to apply the scientific method here if we want to publish papers about that. So we did some experiments at the ICMP. So let's uh, let's take a step back. We we took a camera, just a regular cam camera from Canon. Uh, and we just took a series of pictures and we uh, increased the distance. Uh, we always took one picture, then moved back one meter and took another picture and so on. And we did this seven times and the, the picture is actually pretty good. And the basic idea is I wanted to figure out how many pixels do you really need uh, in order to see something on the iris. And the next thing we did is we didn't take a normal camera but an infrared camera instead. And an infrared camera is uh, where the, the detection of the iris works in the infrared spectrum because dark eyes are much better visible here and the resolution and the structures are, are much, much better when you look at it in the infrared spectrum. So when you look at this closely, it looks slightly different. So if I had made a print of my eyes, it didn't work with Kevin's eyes, so we kind of went through the to the infrared picture and this picture right here the iris has is 75 pixels wide so the distance uh, the distance from from the person that we took the photo of was uh, was about six and a half meters so you will need an infrared camera for dark eyes but there are also cameras that have a special mode for for night shots or what you can also do is you can just take a camera apart and remove the infrared filter and that will also help so and if you do that you can do the same thing for dark eyes. An extreme example, we have a co-worker who is from India. He has really, really dark eyes. You can barely see a thing. But even if we took a picture where the iris was 75 pixels wide, we were able to fool that device. So uh, basically, iris detection is something that is really broken by now. Just wait. It was always uh, with the laboratory conditions. But what you did now? We tried it in public, not in the laboratory. And what's better than uh, doing the experiment with the politicians, with the chancellor? 
we were in contact with journalists with two photographs who did it for us. Same camera that we use on the ICMP. In this case, slightly better objective, a 400 objective with an extender. It's a bit more expensive, it costs 10,000 euro, but this picture was taken from a distance of 5 meters. Um, and the iris had a diameter with, of 110 pixels, so we were far away from the 75 pixels. So we could still slightly extend the distance, uh, 10 meters are uh, absolutely possible. The structures were visible very fine. My colleague had the idea, let's look for high resolution pictures like um, post, uh, election posters, when they are really big, they have a really good resolution. So Chancellor Merkel gave her iris for free, willingly, with a diameter of 175 pixels. Did you have a look? And red eyes. So ob ob uh, obviously they, they did something with the pho photograph. Or they uh, gave the Chancellor two days of sleep to recover. <coughs> Face recognition. Well, I didn't want to talk about this, but a while ago with my ex-colleague, I made a nice video that uh, I simply want to show you. In this case, it's about face recognition, is, is a photograph sufficient or is a mobile phone photograph sufficient, will it work with the black-white photo, uh, photograph? So, can, so I th th think it, we cannot regard it as secure any longer. The difficulty was the life recognition, so seeing, seeing whether the, it's a photo or a living object. Das ist mein ex -Kollege. This is my ex-colleague. Der da jetzt gleich so schön in die Kamera winken wird. He's waving at the camera right now. Test before. Und zwar das Blinken ähm, löst die Lebenderkennung aus. Das heißt, the blinking starts the, the, the living recognition. So what, what we did then was we didn't need a video. We simply needed a pen. Moment. Wait a second. Das heißt, jetzt hat das Gesicht gerade erkannt. Now he recognized the face. Now we take the span here. Und beim zweiten Mal hat es dann auch tatsächlich. And at the second attempt, it actually worked. <laughs> ja, also. Well. Um, Ja, was soll ich dazu sagen? What shall I say? Okay, ähm, kommen wir nun zu den Fingern. Now let's talk about fingers. The same that we, uh, we did for the iris and what we did with the um, cameras laying on the tabletop. We did with the fingers and we tried to take photos of fingerprints and we uh, record the distance and we uh, check whether they are still recognizable or not. What we did then was, we tried to see how they look like. The picture on the left was taken from a distance of three meters. The right hand picture was taken from seven meters distance. You see the difference. The two meter picture has a good resolution, it works fine. And it was the blueprint for the for the fingerprint. Now what I want to to show you is how to teach the system this uh, to learn the, the fingerprint. I have to start this virtual machine before. So this is my um, digit index finger. 
Und jetzt versuchen wir es mal. Das hat no, vorhin, als ich es auf der Bühne noch mal getestet hat, ähm, auch nicht funktioniert. When it tried it, uh, at the beginning of the show, it didn't work. Bilder gleichzeitig sehen kann. Deswegen. So now. Ähm, nee, du musst schon, du musst leider tatsächlich das andere Bild zeigen. Ich bin hier die andere Picture. Now let's see. You see, you, you don't really see how hard I have to work to make this work. Also die das Material normalerweise haben wir immer Holzleim. Usually we have, we take glue, but as you can see now it works. Nice. Vielen Dank. Thanks a lot. Usually we took uh, glue, but it takes too much time. And it breaks rather um, so, rather soon, so you can't use it uh, after a short distance of time. So the, what we then took was a latex milk. It's also available in skin color, so you can make something that rather much looks like a finger. So, das heißt, jetzt geht's weiter mit Let's continue with the keynote. Here it is. Ähm, ja, hier well. wir stehen geblieben. So, that's where we left. Also, wie gesagt, wir hatten, wir hatten hier mal said, die ausgemessen, zu welcher Breite das auch sinnvoll ist. Und, uh, is, uh, und, uh, because we tried it a uh, couple of minutes ago with the infrared camera and we would simply would, uh, checked how these fingerprints look like in infrared light. So uh, the picture that you can see here um, looks like um, pictures that are taken from three meter di uh, distance and you still can take a fingerprint from that. So the picture that you just saw had a um, diameter of 150 pixels and had, uh, which is like a distance of five meters. So with the infrared camera, you can can make um, make a copy from six meter di di distance. So this was with the bar uh, laboratory conditions, and now um, with real life conditions. In dem Fall, das war so das erste Bild, was wir hatten. It was the first picture that we had, and it simply was that perfect, with the name readable at the bottom and with the thumbs up. This was taken on a press conference with a 200 objective, three meter distance. So if you extrapolate it, there is still space left and as you can see um the picture has some hurts, but um well it's it may be uh, quite usable so so but, but uh, you can uh, post processes and you could um well fill the gaps so we took a couple of pictures so it theoretically it would be possible to make a real big fingerprint for that and a colleague of mine uh, actually tried this with a couple of pictures to do them together. But um, when I tr uh, ran some tests, um, well, I didn't succeed. So, but then the uh, Congress started and I finally said, well, I can't take your picture. Sorry about that. So, but you can imagine uh, taking a couple of, of pictures and uh, while overlapping them, then you can fill the, the gaps that you can see here. Dann hat man im Endeffekt irgendwie auch ein sehr schickes Bild. And in the result, the, the picture might be quite usable. The main problem here was the death resolution. So the light conditions are not that critical, and especially if you ta uh, take the um, infrared light. But um, death resolution is uh, is the problem. What can we do there? There's this uh, brand new technology that is called Neutro. A light field camera. So these cameras don't actually um, do, take a photograph on on a, on a film, but um, they instead they take a picture that more or less looks like a uh, 3D picture, and you can decide which layer you want to. Uh, 
have in good resolution and which not. So this is quite fine if um, you um, have to work with different layers. So this led to the next steps that um, I'd like to work on. I think there is still left, uh, left room for improvement. So the focus of these, of these cameras is quite good, so the pictures might be quite useful. And I think we can do, still do a lot with that. Yeah, like we have just seen, uh, you see him, Councilor Merkel standing like this, and you know why, and now you know why. And I would just um, show you uh, a video because I was quite fast. I uh, did not do this last time, uh, how, um, what you have to do to get a fingerprint of an iPhone. You, you enter the PIN and normally you would just um, do a normal uh, fingerprint on the iPhone. In this case, uh, he, I just use it normally and it's not as optimal, but it's good for normal use. Uh, to get a picture, so yeah, then we scan it. Uh, it's a little bit more high, resolu high resolution than a normal scanner. Uh, we bought that for a, a science project we did. The picture is scanned in black and white, and that's the original what you get from the scanner and you invert it, so you have a blueprint and then we invert it to um, make a print from it, then we print it on a normal uh, overhead foil. Um, that's normally a paper what you use uh, for um, Sorry. Uh, you put um, photo um, so it's basically a process that is used um, in order to make electronic components uh, and uh, you can do it in your kitchen if you want so everything that I show here uh, is something that you can do at home with uh, with things that you have in your household. So this is the the fingerprint that we have we have gotten, and we put a little of uh, graphite graphite spray on that. And it's also it is a conductor of electric current. So. The, the sensor that, the, that is built into the iPhone can easily be fooled with, uh, with this copy of the fingerprint. It's a little bit difficult peeling it off, but now we have a very nice artificial fingerprint. So this is my real finger here. So there was this site that was called uh, Touch ID Hacked Yet. The first one to hack the Touch ID was uh, would get a number of bitcoins or something. So that's why we uh, paid attention to this uh, video being a very high quality video. So this is my finger. This is my original finger. It works perfectly. And Next to me, my co-worker, he is using the fake fingerprint. It doesn't work at the first try, it doesn't work in the second try, but after the third try, he gets access to my iPhone. And as you could see, it did not work with his real finger without the, uh, the fake fingerprint. It wasn't a perfect perfect day where we published this. It was election day, basically. And as I said, we were expecting to have a little bit of fun for the iPhone for maybe a number of weeks, but we had broken it after two days. And so we, we actually published the information uh, at 6 in the evening on election day. 
and uh, we got a lot of heat for that. But I, I talked to a number of people and they said they expected us to basically uh, work for maybe a two months on this project, but there you go. All right, so that was really it. Okay, we have a lot of time for questions, so if anyone has questions, we have six mics in the room. Yeah, hello, hey. Hi, Sarah. Hello, 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 Sarah. Uh, it's mostly used for, for doing macro photos, but you can also use this for this purpose. Um, can you use the front camera to uh, get the, print, uh, the thumb of it? Open, right in the corner. Well, the problem is that uh, the camera is not able to get a clear picture because the thumb is so close to it. So you have to have a about 10 centimeters distance from the camera to the to the thumb. So um, that's basically why we decided to go with our solution. There may be special cases where uh, using the front camera would work, but it's more difficult. Do we have a question from uh, our signal angel from the IRC or Twitter? Yeah, the internet wants to know if you can use uh, for the reproduction of biometric material. Well, if you if you uh, touch your passport with your fingers, you will leave the same fingerprints uh, as on any other object. But uh, other than that, uh, it's it's a perfect because essentially what's on that uh, electronic document is pictures of your fingerprints. Uh, the difference is that these pictures are encrypted, and it's not that easy to get the key to decrypt those. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it would work, but. Um, we haven't tried it out, and uh, our solution seemed to make more sense for us. I have a short question if the f um, p slides are online. Yes, we will make the slides available um, later after this presentation. There are also so hand scans. These are scans that actually take pictures of your veins as, they, as the blood flows through them. Um, this is something I wanted to do, but I wasn't able to do it in the last few weeks. There are a number of things that we have tried out, but it wasn't ready to do in a presentation. But one thing that we did, because we already had this infrared camera, we took very nice pictures of of the veins in, under your skin. So I'm not sure if everyone's aware of how these things work. They're basically using infrared light to uh, make a picture through the, the, through the skin. And apparently, blood absorbs uh, light of a certain wavelength, so the veins will actually look black in the picture. And the veins are one of the very few um, biometric um, identification attributes that you cannot simply take a picture of, but with an infrared camera and a nice infra infrared flashlight. Um, these are pretty powerful, and uh, we have done a number of experiments, uh, and you can actually see the veins pretty nicely on the pictures, so um, stay tuned. Um, this is something Thanks. that we Thanks will so research. Actually, just only a short question. How much have you worked with co uh, compressions for the iris pictures? Um, you print out uh, the picture for the iris, and when do you reach the uh, boundaries of JPEG compressions? Well, we didn't use 1200. Oh, hang on. We, we did use a 600 DPI printer. That was didn't work too well. When the resolution of your picture is reduced by half, um, it still worked in a, f in a good number of cases. There were some cases where it didn't work, but with half the resolution, uh, it was also very usable. But it's, I mean, it's not necessary. We are talking about 
uh, 75 pixels, and uh, this is not a problem for, for, a, for a good camera. Jetzt hier möchte noch was von euch wissen, ja. Um, und zwar zum einen würden Sie gerne noch mal sehen, den Zoom an die Iris, weil man das wohl im Stream um, The RC would like to see the zoom to the Iris, because that was not possible to see in the stream. Dieses schöne Bild. Okay, we have this nice picture here. And we also have this nice picture here. It was especially about the picture um, with, uh, where we recognize the keys on the keypad. Uh, so this must be, this is taken with a front camera of a phone. So if we actually zoom in here, you can, uh, I think it's, it's uh, well visible. And this is just, uh, a little was that what one thing that we cut off the picture and we made it bigger? And I will make these slides available online. And there's another question. And, uh, and if there's a, a club where you can learn how to um, uh, learn how to make fake fingerprints. Well, I'm not going to go into details about the political or uh, legal implications, but. Um, it's obvious that you can use these fake fingerprints to uh, basically put anyone's fingerprints on a weapon or a gun, for example, or on an ATM machine or wherever you want, and you, you, you know what I mean. Um, what technique have you used uh, or what software um, to extract the black and white pictures from the photos you have taken? Uh, this is an SDK which is called Verifinger. Um, long time ago it was free and I'm still using it. I think you can buy it for a couple of hundred euros. Um, earlier today I saw an article uh, on the website of a German newspaper Die Zeit and uh, I think they had a link where you can purchase this software. It's something that you don't really need. You can use, for example, GIMP to do it or you can do it manually. But it's good to get uh, a first draft basically of, your, of the fingerprint and then you just put the, uh, the original picture and that picture uh, on top of each other and then you can just uh, redraw the lines. Uh, that might be a naive question, and every fingerprint is unique. So you have worked with one from ten, so to make it really objective, you would need a bigger sample? Yes, that is correct. So, well, at least in the case of uh, Ms. Van der Leyen and Ms. Merkel, we basically focused on one single finger because when, you, when you're talking to uh, one of these persons, uh, your best bet is go for the thumb. But um, you can think of other opportunities such as when something simple as when they are waving or, or giving a thumbs up or something and, and holding her hand in the camera. Uh, it's easy to imagine that you can take good pictures of the other fingers as well. Yeah, so, I have I have a question, question to the technique you have used for uh, biometrical identification that is used in train stations and it's less the iris or the fingerprint, it's more like the distance between the eyes and the mouse mouth uh, the spacing. And the second question would be how could you protect yourself from from that so you don't get recognized by a metric identification process? You can uh, try to conceal your face. There has been a study a couple of years ago that uh, was dealing with face recognition in public places and they had this very nice example. Uh, uh, those, uh, those people who were wearing thick glasses uh, were often confused by the software because it was focusing on the thick framed glasses. And the, uh, the face recognition software usually works by taking the distance between the eyes and then uses that as a base in order to... Uh, I think to uh, it's a spacing of 30 pixels that is needed. 
Well, one thing you can do to protect yourself is, for example, if if you um, have to give someone your, your photo, you can, for example, uh, move your eyes together so that you will actually reduce the distance between your pupils. And uh, if the picture is distorted in any way, or if you are wearing a hat, or a fake beard, or glasses, uh, this makes it harder for the software. And there are a number of websites that uh, deal with that. I have seen pictures of people uh, with a uh, third eye that they had painted on their face. So <laughs> there are actually some sites that can give you makeup tips, uh, which you can use to, to defeat or to basically to uh, avoid uh, being recognized um, by face recognition software. Okay, we have learned that uh, biometric identification is a stupid idea, but um, so maybe a pin. Well, wear gloves. Then, yeah, I still have the problem that when I enter the pin that you can see uh, what I'm typing through my iris. How can I protect myself from that? Well, close your eyes while you're typing. <laughs> Well, countermeasures, we haven't really uh, put a lot of thought into that. The easiest thing is probably to cover the lens of the camera and that way you can avoid that the camera Thanks. takes pictures of you without you knowing. There we have something. Uh, give me a second. Do you have... Um, <laughs> Any experience with uh, uh, fingerprint door openers? Yeah, they're all crap. I haven't seen a single uh, mechanism that you couldn't break easily. Uh, the one that required the most work from us was probably the iPhone because the sensor has a fairly high resolution, but even the uh, new devices that are used at borders, for example, they also measure the conductivity of a finger, but um, it was, even with these devices, it was fairly easy to construct a fake fingerprint. Uh, and the same fake fingers, fingerprints that I used to build seven or eight years ago still work for these devices. Okay, give us a micro three. I wanted to ask two questions. First, if there is, uh, with the fingerprint, uh, with the principle uh, of fingerprint, of faking a fingerprint, uh, if it's enough if you use graphite with the glue, um, because if you have, you if you were in gloves, um, um, why when you're handling um, the um, the phone? Um, so why does it doesn't bug it um, when there's something not uh, conducting between the thumb and the, and the phone? Well, the black thing, that dummy that we used, this was the thing that the system recognized as my thumb. So also from the print, because the phone is uh, does not react to the picture of of the thumb, also from the um, uh, electricity that is being c conducted? Well, in the case of the iPhone, I think they are somehow projecting an HF field into the finger and this gets reflected and it measures the reflection. But like I just said, the system with the graphite and all that um, was able to defeat the system and it, it fooled the system with a high success rate so apparently the, the reflection must have looked, uh, for the system, must have looked like a real finger, and I hope that was understandable. Otherwise, we can talk about this after, after the presentation. A photographic note uh, to the uh, hydro canals, because I think it's a bad idea, because they um, achieve their focusing qualities with uh, lightning reduction. Well, what's interesting is that the resolution doesn't play such a big role. Uh, a couple of hundred DPI is, uh, or the older iPhones have even less than that, it's sufficient. But the nice thing about the uh, biometrics is, for example, with the fingerprints, if you 
if you press harder with your thumb, the, the lines will be further apart. So th there has to be some sort of tolerance here. So it's not actually a problem if there's a couple of percent uh, tolerance in, in our picture. The death resolution problem can be uh, solved by simply making it a bit darker. Uh, so, so possibly by, by, by making the lighting conditions a bit better, uh, um, you can solve this problem. And you can um, rent objective for a couple of days, so um, you don't have to make this big investment. Okay, all clear. Then on micro 3, please. Das ist einfach nur eine Frage. Simple question. May NGOs record um, these, these biometric um, items from politicians and other people? Not what you think. Well, our former Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Schäuble, said that he is fine with it. But it's an interesting question. So, uh, if your point of view is that these are, this is personally identifiable information, uh, then of course the data that is in your passport uh, has to be protected Thanks by the same law. So, my stance on that is let's just continue doing that and we'll see what happens. Let's see what there is. A short question from the internet. In I see there was the question coming up whether. Mrs. von der Leyen's uh, fingerprint will also be published like the fingerprint of um, Mr. Schäuble. Um, well, um, I would have done it, but if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. So with Mr. Schäuble, we, we had to do some manual work, and I wasn't able to do this in time for the Congress, but we are going to do that. And of, of course, everyone, um, if you are at an election party or something or see a politician somewhere, take a photo of them when they're waving and doing this with their hands. I have a guess why your uh, uh, copies will still work. And um, I think they, they need some automated... Um, uh, quality assurance, and they don't need someone waving her finger. For quality assurance, they also want to have uh, dummies in, in their um, machines. Well, yeah, very nice. Well, maybe one thing, um, because the police is actually taking interest in detecting fakes, uh, because I think uh, European countries are going to start taking the fingerprints of U.S. citizens. And this is uh, not a nice thing for, for spies, because uh, it could happen that the fingerprints are certainly um, contributed to another person. A question from the IRC about the indirect reflections. What will happen if I enter my PIN at the ATM and someone is standing uh, behind me, but uh, it's not then, uh, he's not looking at me, but you have a reflection in his glasses. Well, have a look at the CCS paper, paper from 2013 from uh, Mr. Xu, that's XU. They are dealing with that topic and they did some experiments. They put a cup of coffee somewhere and they were taking a picture and uh, they could see the reflection of the eye in the coffee pot and uh, they did stuff like that. So they, they, there's an actual, an actual danger there. Uh, once uh, the resolution of the camera reaches a certain quality, this becomes a problem. I have a question about the photograph fingerprints. So a finger, uh, Schäuble had the glass direct in front of him, but the photograph of von der Leyen. So you don't know uh, on the, from the photograph how big her finger actually is. So does it doesn't make, play a role? Well, yeah, that's correct. I mean, it does play a role to a certain extent. But the systems have a lot of flexibility uh, when it comes to the size. And, uh, and on top of that, fingers usually don't have huge size differences. Um, I think we were able to uh, enlarge it or shrink it by up to 20% and the system would still recognize it. So there's actually uh, a good level of tolerance. And if in doubt, uh, 
just find a picture where she has, for, ex for example, she's wearing a Rolex and you know the size of the watch and then you can defer the size of the thumb. How about videos? Did you try extract fingerprints from videos? Also, well, ich darf das, ich darf das eigentlich gerade gar nicht erzählen, um, weil Actually, I'm, I'm not supposed to, uh, to tell you this, but because in, in scientific circles, it's when you're writing a paper, you shouldn't talk about the things that you're doing in your paper on a conference, and that's that's why I'm only going to say 4K porn. So, the question was whether it's possible to extract fingerprints from 4K, 4K videos. No further Thanks comments on that. Just a short remark. And you can buy a 50, uh, 25 euro camera um, for the Raspberry Pi, and you can do uh, take infrared uh, normal photographs with it. Very good. Thanks.